Hello and good evening. My name is Dan Pfeiffer, and I'm thrilled to be back at the Commonwealth Club in person to moderate a program. And I'm so glad the club is returning to more in-person programs as the region starts to re return from the pandemic. You can learn more about the club's in-person offerings on the club website at www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm particularly glad to be the moderator for tonight's program with the always thought-provoking Lily Geismer. Lily is a professor at Claremont McKenna College and the author of a wonderful new book, Left Behind, The Democrats' Failed Attempt to Solve Inequality. We're here to discuss this fascinating book, and I'm eager to jump into the conversation because it discusses some of the issues we often discuss on Pod Save America that I've written about in my time, how Democrats lost their way in fighting inequality and what this means for the party and the country, and how we get back to those roots. One final note, if you have any questions for Professor Geismer or me and are here in the room, please write them on a question card, and they will be brought to me throughout the program. For those watching online, please post them in the YouTube chat box. Those questions will be brought to me as well. I can't wait to see how that happens. Okay, let's jump in, Lily. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. It's great to be here with you in person. I have not done a Commonwealth Club in-person event in more than two years, so this is very exciting. I'm very excited to be here with you. Well, I'm so excited to embrace kind of market-oriented thinking, um, and especially the tech industry, and I started wanting to, to, answer, to address that question of Democrats increasingly using these ideas of the market um, in the 1970s and 1980s, and sort of thinking of, about that as a bigger story. So that book actually ends with the Democratic leadership. Um, the other thing that really um, I w was thinking a lot about was this: where this this thinking, where these ideas in the market come. And there's often this story about the um, the Democrats, and especially under Bill Clinton, that the reasons that they embrace um, market-oriented thinking um, was was in response to the Republicans. And so the Democratic Party, from the period sort of after 1968, is always told the story of very um, a weak party, always defensive. And I wanted to sort of challenge that thinking and sort of think about what they actually believed in um, and why they became so invested in these market um, this these market thinking um, the third reason actually um, is my was from my vantage point as a professor and that a lot of my students um, especially in the period sort of um, around the 2010 to like 2014 um, were increasingly um, invested in these ideas, they're sort of private um, and market th solutions to to to, um, to social problems, and especially sort of wanted to go into the private sector as a space to do good. And they all were Democrats, mm -hmm. um, and so I was sort of wanted to think like, why is this the way that um, such a generation of people have really come to sort of think in these ways? And so it, that led me to think to going back to the 1990s to understand that. So to sort of set the table for this conversation, let's do a little um, sort of. That, like sort of basic building block definition. So when you say market-oriented solutions, tell us what you mean and tell us what that is in contrast to. Sure. So there, it's in con so in um, the idea of kind of it's the idea of using the pri it works in a couple of different ways. One is to kind of literally use the private sector to do the work that was once under the domain of the public sector. So that's one way of thinking about uh, what a market-oriented solution mm. is. Another is to kind of use the mechanisms of the market. Um, so um, so techniques that we sort of think about from, that the private sector uses, particularly around efficiency, um, accountability, things that sort of um, that more business business um, oriented solutions, but to address social problems and what it replaces is the traditional m means um, that liberalism or the Democratic Party operated in, which would be more focused on um, big government programs, um, government assistance, redistribution. Those is the kind of mechanisms that such th to, through which you would address social problems. And sort of the, the height of that latter form of government-oriented solution was, you would say, New Deal through Lyndon Johnson? Yeah, so that's sort of the, that period, the sort of period we, we call it um, the kind of um, the New Deal or liberal consensus, yep. that, that type of thinking. So that, that idea of kind of that, that the way to solve problems is through big government. And so um, Lyndon Johnson really, the Great Society is, is really seen as the kind mm. of high watermark of that, of carrying on the ideas of, of um, the New Deal. And there are a couple of different within the course of your book different sort of descriptions of types of Democrats, right? I wanna sort of try to explain them and disentangle them for various people because some of these terms are, be, are thrown around now in a ways that I think may be somewhat misleading, both for how, what the word really means and how it replied back then. So let's start with new Democrat. 
So the New Democrats, um, I, now I feel like I'm getting a quiz. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's like, um, I know you know the answer, um, so, so yes. I, what if I get it wrong? Um, uh. the, um, the, New Democrats, um, the New Democrats are a term. So, so one of the things that's interesting, and we might get to the other terms that yeah. sort of build into this yeah. as well. Um, there's a group, the group of Democrats sort of at, from the 1960s. So, so like the New Deal, that's easy to, to define yeah. uh, if you want me to do that too. I no, guess. no, no, no. But, I think um, we can but, agree on that one, I think. Um, but, um, this is a very but, erudite audience, uh, I guess. Okay. So, um, but um, the, uh, the way that we think about the, so the, there's these various different groups of Democrats who start to emerge, and the New Democrats are a group that kind of come coalesce under the um, the Democratic Leadership Council, which is this group of Democrats who are very committed to changing the direction of the party and especially moving it much more to what they saw they would call the political mainstream or to the um, or to the center of American politics. And so how they define themselves is that they were a new, basically a new generation of Democrats who didn't who were going against those mm. older programs of um, and older ideas of the Democratic Party, which were represented by the Great Society or um, or the New Deal. And then so neoliberals or neo neoliberalism is something that is thrown around a lot now, as you say in your book, on Twitter particularly. What does that mean and how does that fit into this context? So that's the, that is the, and I knew that that's where we were going with yeah. this question. Um, that's the hardest in some ways the term to define. And so in some ways that, that was actually another core um, issue and question that I wanted to address in this book is sort of thinking about the ways that which neoliberalism gets used. Because very often that is a term that, um, that is used especially in places like Twitter to describe mm -hmm. the Clintons. Um, and so that, that, that they're, it, it's used as actually a term about the Democrats and that there's a, this conflation of kind of how we think about um, Bill Clinton to other kinds of neoliberalism. So neoliberalism as a philosophy traditionally as actually has its roots in, um, in um, Frederick Hayek and the right and Milton mm -hmm. Friedman. And it's an idea that the kind of free market is the best, um, the best mechanism through which, and limited government is the best way to bring about choice and individual freedom. And that's what, like its core of what, new, of what neoliberalism is. Um, the interesting question th is that there was a group of Democrats actually in the early 1980s who then also adopt mm. this term in a kind of a positive mm. or affirmative way that that's what, how they were describing themselves, that they were new liberals and that sort of evolves into new Democrat. Um, one thing I, want, I aim to do through the book is actually to show that um, the version of neoliberalism that the Clinton, that the New Democrats mm. and the DLC and Clintons adopt is, um, is actually in some ways distinctive from the kind of traditional Milton Friedman mm. style approach. Um, that actually it's, it's not as kind of the free market for the sake of the free market. Um, rather, they come to understand the market as a mechanism through which to achieve kind of traditional liberal goals and especially to kind of bring out, to address um, problems of inequality and bring more opportunity to people. Okay, and who are the Atari Democrats? So, th so that's um, that um, that is another kind of critical term that is also sort of attached to the ne um, to around neoliberals. And so, the Atari Democrats. There's actually an, an, is uh, I'll, I'll I'll tell the story chrono I'll tell this chronologically um, mm -hmm. in some ways. So the other group that of all these terms, and one of the things that ends up happening um, in this group of Democrats who come into office. Um, after 1968, um, is actually there's a there's like a decade where they can't figure out what to call them what, <laughs> what to call them. So they're initially called the Watergate Babies, um, and that's it's a huge group of um, of um, of Democratic. Um, Democrats are elected to co actually to Congress and to um, both to the Senate and also to um, gubernatorial races um, and our governorships. They um, they are called the Watergate Babies because they they came in office in 1974. They actually were in opposition in many ways, not less to Nixon and more to the Democratic establishment. They then a lot of those people, and I'm just saying it, it's people like Tim Worth um, mm. and especially Al, Al Gore, who actually mm. he enters in 1976. They then get called um, at the Atari Democrats. Democrats. It's a term I love. Um, it co it's actually Chris Matthews who comes up with oh, it well, at the go. time. Who yes. was, um, he was working for Tiff O'Neill, and he's like, "There's no they're nothing but a bunch of Atari Democrats." And what he was trying to imply by the term was their in, their their strong embrace of the tech industry and tech as a mechanism through which to address um, economic growth and opportunity. Was this the moment when Al Gore invented the internet? It's the yeah. same time. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. He good, also good, good. he also invented Atari. Yes, so, so there you it's, go. It's, um, yes. it's so and they actually. What's the, my favorite is that um, Tim Worth said, "I wish." you'd call us Apple Democrats. It sounds more democratic. That's and they, they actually do embrace, um, briefly embrace Atari Democrat, but then, um, but then Atari moved its operations to, um, 
to <laughs> I think it's like to somewhere to, to Asia and then they were yeah. like we can't we have to we have to cut ourselves <laughs> in that term but I think it's I think I would if I was a strategist I would go with Atari Democrat yes yeah, so, but whether you're a Republican or a Democratic <laughs> strategist yes um, so just to also set some context your book is was fascinating it was truly fascinating to read and it was very interesting for me to read because the period in which you cover up through the Clinton administration is largely before my active time in politics. I My first campaign was Al Gore's presidential campaign, which is a campaign that he sort of famously ran, or at least ended, on the exact opposite of his Atari Democrat roots, where he sort of embraced the people versus the powerful as his slogan and sort of some late stage, not, I think, entirely, may perhaps authentically believed and authentically delivered populism at the end of that campaign. Many of the people in this book uh, are friends of mine who I worked with in the Obama administration over the years. Uh, and uh, also am someone who sort of grew up in politics aware, you know, sort of in that Clinton era, grew, sort of soured on it enough that I go, went to go work for the long shot person taking on the heir to the Clinton legacy. So the whole thing was very fascinating to look at from that perspective and now from where we are today. But I want to get to your uh, core, and also I generally have a sympathetic view of people in politics who, where all their decisions don't work out right. Um, but you're sort of the you you wrote this book, as you said, to sort of test the idea that the centrism, market oriented approach, however you want to look at it, of Clinton era Democrats or '90s era Democrats was not a product entirely or mostly of the limits the Republicans put on him, but was something born of their own ideology, their own beliefs. Help, help explain that, because that runs counter to, to the common understanding of that period, as told by a lot of the people in that period. Yeah, I mean, so, and, um, and so this is one of the key things I wanted to get at, was that, that it's not just, um, that, and it's not to say that they, that the era of Democrats from the 70s through the 2000s were working in this like frictionless world where there yeah. was no Republican Party that they had a very powerful Republican Party they had to contend with. But I think that it there the strategy, especially in adopting this kind of market based uh, market oriented thinking, and especially the strong focus on growth. Um, emerges largely from, I mean, in, in two ways, and this is the, this was where we get slightly arcane, but is um, in some ways in the crisis of Keynesian economic theory that it just had broken down and they needed to find a new solution. And so that's what the Atari Democrat term comes from that of like, we need to figure out economic growth through um, the new, what becomes called the new economy sectors of tech, um, tech, finance, um, and especially, uh, and, tr and trade, and that, that those can also solve the problems of poverty. And what I want to show in the book is that this isn't just defensive or strategic things that come up, I mean, that, that at election, mm. at election time, um, that they really believed in this approach. They really believed that this would be a way both to sort of address, I mean, I use a lot of the, um, the language in the book of sort of doing well by doing good, that you could do mm. both things at the same time, that you could you grow the economy and help poor people um, and low income people. And that that is really where a lot of this kind of the what we what is now on Twitter called neoliberalism, um, where it comes from. And sort of what's the context in which this generation of Democrats come, come to adopt this viewpoint? Is it a a belief that the previous New Deal liberal consensus policies have failed or no longer politically possible? Is it how much of it's a response to Reaganism? You know, sort of because it's a very it is sort of it all happens at once. Right there. And what are the sort of the. I think related to that, what are sort of the flashpoints within the party about where this, how this debate happens and plays out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a combination of all those things. So it is this moment in the 1970s where um, the larger ideas of economic growth aren't working. There's also this sort of generational frustration with the way that the, where the party is. Another key piece of that is um, one of their the other big critiques of this group who then it's easiest to call them the kind of new Democrats, um, is against um, the Democratic parties, what they see as sort of capture by special interest groups, especially by organized labor, and they want to move away from that approach. So they, they see labor as a drag both on the economy, but also in the Democratic Party. That and they being the- uh, the, the new Democrats. Yeah. I mean, so it's it's this, it's this um, fundamental sort of critique of that approach. Um, and the moments that really sort of help to solidify this, I mean, and actually, you know, um, 
I mean, this might be a, like a, the kind of nerdy political historian in that, me. That's, that's why we're here. Okay, so, yeah. so that's, um, but um, is that oftentimes the elections of the 1980s get, uh, the Democratic side gets told as sort of like just complete failures, but they're actually really interesting moments of like alternative mm -hmm. paths and opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so those to me are flashpoints that you have um, in that in both of those primaries, you actually had really competitive races and that they actually stand for these kinds of different directions the party might have gone in. And that's, you also see this kind of solidification of these particular values. Is so. this 80 and 88? Um, I would say 84 and 88. Um, and um, I mean, 80 is an interesting election too, um, because you have Ted Kennedy as this kind of as a challenger. But in the 84 election, you have Gary Hart, who's like a classic Atari Democrat, um, um, Walter Mondale, who stands for this older version of the Democratic Party. And then you also have Jesse Jackson, who's this other alternative. And in in the aftermath of that moment, the heart, the um, after after Mondale captures the nomination and then loses the um, l loses in a landslide, you have this the founding of the Democratic Leadership Council. So that is this key moment. But also in 1988 is another moment of like a sense of kind of possibility of a lot of these different candidates, and then a sense of sort of failure that there's a doubling down a particular type of, of strategy and style. And I think that also leads to the emergence of, of Bill Clinton um, later, who does, um, and we can, I mean, I don't know if jumping forward to that, but, but I do think is, is really pivotal for bringing together a lot of these ideas um, and being able to kind of, I think, to go back to your people mm. versus powerless, yeah. I mean, he was able to sell that in a much more convincing way. And I think Cl that's- Bill Clinton was. Bill Clinton. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's like, so that idea of like, like sort of taking some of these market oriented ideas um, and positioning them within a broader language of populism that was really effective politically. So that I see as a kind of key moment of really bringing a lot of these ideas into fruition. And then once the Clinton, Clinton wins in an office, there's an opportunity to kind of implement a lot of these ideas. And let's talk a little about the Democratic Leadership Council because they are central to this whole endeavor. And if you were someone who started following politics, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago, you would yeah. have no concept of who they were or why that they were ever important. So let's talk about who they are and the role they where, where they came from and the role they played. Yeah. So and there, it's an, it is true that they're it's they've kind of fallen out, but there's a yep. moment they hold this they have this real this real moment of power. Um, the Democratic Leadership Council forms in the aftermath of the um, the 1984 election um, of a group of of the these kind of members of Congress um, who want to shift the party towards more, more market-oriented thinking, and also a group of Southern, largely Southern moderate Republican, or sorry, Democratic, that was a Freudian slip, I guess. Um, yeah, yes, yes. The um, Democratic um, governors who want to move the party um, more towards the center. Um, and they decide, it's a, it's a group, they call themselves the Democratic Leadership Council. It's a group of, of politicians. It's a small it's a, it's a small group. It's led by the founding um, director was Al Gore, who's a congressional staffer. Um, who takes Al, Fr Al, Al, Fr Al Fromm, did I say yeah. Al Gore? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Again, I'm like, <laughs> okay. my, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Al Gore is a founding member. He yes. actually writes their first press release. Um, and, um, and Bill Clinton's also a founding member, as is Joe Biden. And so it's it's primarily their found, their early membership is um, is um, all um, white men, largely from the South, and so they get assailed. Um, Jesse Jackson fam famous, famously calls them the Democrats, the leisure class, um, mm -hmm. and accuses them of trying to like suburbanize the party. Um, and they, when they re they they after the 1980 election, decide to like really double down um, and figure out a kind of strategy for the party to move it move it toward more towards the direction that they see and one of the key things they there's a they write this memo called the politics of evasion that gets at these ideas um, that the party needs to not sort of focus on trying to win over um, um, voters people who are not voting basically and marginalized groups and instead focus on trying to win um, people voters who've been shifting over to the Republican Party largely moderate suburbanites. Um, that's critical to their strategy. They also really focus on the presidency, that they say like the way for the Democrats to maintain power is to hold, is to capture the presidency. So it's, these politicians are part of it. Um, and Bill Clinton is a founding member, but not critical. But then in the, in 1990, they just, they both really um, hone in on their ideology, which is the, they write this statement. Um, and at the heart of it is the idea that, that um, that the Democrats should be expanding opportunity, not government, largely through market-oriented mechanisms. And so that's really at the heart of like the sort of theory and philosophies that I'm interested in examining. 
Um, and then they named Bill Clinton their um, director, and it's really er, their leader. Um, it's really critical for his career too to sort of take on this role, and so that gives the, the combination of that, this kind of infrastructure plus Bill Clinton, um, then sort of boosts him into to um, being able to capture the nomination in 1982. And they hold, so that's when they really re reach their like peak of power too, because mm -hmm. it sort of proves their theory that this is how you can Democrats can this is the new direction of the party. And Bill Clinton came to the DLC, if I have my time right, after he has won the governorship, lost the governorship, and then re-won the governorship, is that correct? Yes, he, that's right. So, yes. he, he, so Bill Clinton is this sort of... Um, he's uh, 32, I think. He's 32. He, ran, he actually ran in 1974, at like when, he's 20, when he was 28. Yes. So, he, so he, was, he was a little bit older in 19... So, yeah. But he, lo he, he won in 1978 um, the governorship of Arkansas. He loses, in, um, re he loses his re-election, but they had two-year mm -hmm. two races at that point, and then he re-wins in 1982. He, and he's really committed to this approach of economic growth um, through new, the new economy, and also really um, wanting to find kind of new solutions to problems. So it has all these kind of new programs and policies that he's using to address poverty and inequality in Arkansas, and brings those to the... Um, to the um, to the DLC. And I'll say one thing that's really actually really interesting. Um, I interviewed Al Fromm and asked him about this is that like he 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 shaped their platform and philosophy in a lot of ways. So it wasn't just that he was like their the like their puppet or mm -hmm. mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. Like he actually had a critical role, especially on welfare reform, which was something that he was really committed to and so had been working on mm -hmm. wealth things like welfare to work in Arkansas in the nineteen eighties and sort of brings that to the the DLC as like we need to work on this more. And so it makes the that those that becomes another kind of critical fusion. I asked the question about Bill Clinton losing because what is the political context I think is very interesting for the DLC and these members. So the Democratic Party, after having great success in the 30s and 40s, and then Kennedy, LBJ, loses 68, 72, wins 76 in large part because the previous president was on, this, on the way to, way to jail before his successor pardoned him, losing 80. Uh, and in the South in particular, we are in the middle of the post-civil rights transition from the Democratic Electoral Coalition. We are a lot of what had been our base has left the party over Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act. And so you have a bunch of people like Gore and Clinton, who these were strong Democratic states always, where they're seeing this transition happening before them. And then Gore himself is someone, as I mentioned, I worked for, was someone incredibly motivated by the, his fa the loss of his father's Senate seat in 80, I think, right? Uh, no, he, doesn't he lose in, oh, he loses in like 60. Eight. Oh, 68. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, you're right, right, 68, yeah. Um, but like that is his, like he loses as yes. a, being treated as a big government liberal. That really, it's sort of Al Gore's defining um, characteristic. Uh, yeah, it is really interesting. I mean, I, I would say this is a, no. a side note, but one of the things that's fascinating is like his, he's committed to his father's legacy, yeah. but like a different, using a different yeah. sort of political um, philosophy and yeah. strategy. I also worked... Uh, in the early 2000s for Evan Bay, who succeeded Bill Clinton as sort of the face of the DLC, who, whose father did lose in 1980 to Dan Quayle, something that's very hard to get over, and then lived his life exactly like Al Gore, very similar, and they were very similar in lots of ways, but sort of doing, trying to learn the lessons of his father's loss. I guess you could, it's a lot of, you could run this uh, sort of psychological experiment for all, George W. Bush also ran his presidential campaign, related to his father's loss. But I bring all that up to set the sort of the political context for how these decisions are made. But despite that political context, you will, you know, you you argue that these are true beliefs. Like this is the, they believe these are the policy. This is not, you know, these are not closet new deal Democrats who are pretending to be Atari Democrats for the sake of getting elected. They, they have decided the party in terms of not just political strategy and messaging, but also policy agenda has not been updated to reflect the times. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, that, and, and that's actually one of their, their classic, um, the classic kind of New Democrat um, sort of statements is that like the, um, the solutions of the 30s are not going to meet the policies. They say this like the 70s and they're like, 
the 80s and yeah. 90s. So that's like, that's yeah. that's And that's then that we're works. building a bridge to the 21st century. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Um, but there's this idea that like the old solutions are not working. And I do think they believed that. I think one thing that's really critical is like another thing of kind of thinking about this generationally is this is a group of, um, so and I'll use Al Gore, uh, Gore and Clinton are like a sh good shorthand, but mm. it is, there are other critical figures yeah. um, and, and um, some of the other ones that you mentioned who all, um, they were all, um, highly like, Ivy League educated, who also had this kind of faith in meritocratic, like a meritocratic, but also like technocratic approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one thing that with the kind of faith in things like the market, that there was a sense that market solutions were more transparent, they're more efficient, and in a kind of technocratic view, um, that makes more mm -hmm. sense. And so that is part of what they're thinking too, that these like outdated big programs. And I think that one of the things is that they, they believe that like the, um, looking at the great society and those programs, like they didn't actually deliver all that much. Also, it's important, like especially to use Clinton as an example, that the state of Arkansas in the 1980s was going through like severe economic hardship and transition. I mean, it was really feeling the effects mm. of globalization early. And so that he was looking for kind of new means to address mm. the kind of real critical problems of his of the state. And I think the models that he adopts actually w become seen as kind of this can be also work for the country too. But it's true that the demo, I mean, they're, they do have a strategy behind it, their strategy, mm -hmm. but that also there's a, there is a, a core philosophy that they do, I, I, I argue they do yeah. believe in. And sort of the backdrop for a lot of that is a lot of the context they use is the war on poverty, right? And they point to, you know, Clinton does this with Cabrini Green in Chicago where examples of well-intentioned government programs established in the 60s did not deliver the sort of relief that it was promised, right? That poverty won the war on poverty, right? Is it, how, how does that play on people's minds? Well, that is a, I think there's, it's, that's part of it. And it's interesting, like someone like Al Fromm actually got his start in the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. And that's where he, that's where he sort of had his political career and believed in certain ideas of it. But I think there's, that's this idea that those big programs just didn't, are there, they cost a lot of money and they didn't do the things they were set out to do. And there can be new ways to kind of, f to address these problems um, that, um, that won't be, I mean, I will say it's, they both can actually help, but they also won't be as politically cost. Um, because there's another thing. I mean, the other people who were really harsh on the war on poverty and the Great Society mm. were the Republicans at the yeah. time. So I do think there is, to, to not say that it wasn't entirely strategic, there is a component of that, that like this can, we are going to sol solve the problems um, and we're going to sort of prove, we're, we're going to sort of, we're going to prove, we can sort of outrun the, the Republicans on, on some of those, that language. You know, in reading the book, it, you know, it's obviously a very well argued, substantive critique of the failures of new democratic centrism, right? Clintonism, right? Clintonomics, however you want to talk about it. But I actually viewed it as a more sympathetic portrayal of that than I think is the common left critique of Bill Clinton. Well, and that, that it, I, thank you for saying that. Yes. No, because that actually was one of the things that I was, it was not to, it was to do both things, to like take it seriously, to understand like what it was. I really wanted to understand what it was trying to do. And I think that there is this left way of thinking about Clinton that doesn't actually do that, to sort of think mm. about what they were trying to achieve. And so in some ways that was it to, to mm. readers across the political spectrum to kind of understand that position. And I'll say another thing. I mean, so the book itself walks through a lot of these programs to address poverty around public housing, um, welfare reform, microfinance, um, microenterprise, which is really critical to the, to the, the philosophy, and also around banking. Um, and charter schools, I'm now like just listing them off in my head as we go through, but um, in some ways, I think what ends up happening is that there's an overselling of what these programs can do. So it's not to say that they're not all, they're not, a lot of them actually are good, good ideas. Um, they just, they can't replace a social safety net. So that's like what I'm trying, what I want to get at is that like, why did the, the sort of Clinton era Democrats become so interested in these kinds of programs? What do, could they accomplish? But also thinking about the fact that they, they were just really oversold in what they could accomplish. And, and I think the, you know, from to the, what I, what I found it to made it seem sympathetic is, or more sympathetic than the traditional critique. So the traditional critique is, and I think some of it is fair, um, in some, in a couple ways I'll mention, but the traditional leftist critique of Clintonomics is cynical political centrism, triangulation, running against Democrats, 
some you know some suggestions of you hear this one a lot uh, about corruption you know big money friends with business all of that is why we got these centrist policies and your argument is while there may be some cynicism there and i think the bill clinton's decision on welfare reform are pretty well documented the, how the politics played into that the, the bill he signed not a support of welfare reform uh over the years from arkansas on but that it would that these were uh perhaps oversold but genuinely like they thought they were doing the right thing it just didn't work out the way they thought yeah, I think that is, I mean, that, and that was one of the things is to sort of understand that, that they, that it, 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 there, it wasn't solely this sense of mm. like, we're just gonna, I mean, I think, cause that is the, that is the argument of triangulation, mm. like this deep cynicism that like, we'll just like, we'll, we'll like beat them at their own game. And I think that that misses the sort of what it tried to do. And I, and to me, it like, you could say, I mean, some, and I think that there are many people who would argue this, like it doesn't, intent doesn't matter. It's just about the outcome. But to me, right. intent actually does matter because it, it shows, I mean, in some ways it, it can do two things. One is sort of, it shows, um, it shows that there, what, what, and that this, in some ways this philosophy has much more power beyond that moment. So it's trying to understand that thing. But I think also it can obscure some of the, con mm. like some of the consequences too. So in some of the kind of really blanket statements of saying like, this is all bad, you actually miss, like it misses some of the nuance of what was, what it actually, what they did or didn't do. And so if you, if I was a person who worked for Bill Clinton or worked in the Democratic Party in the 90s, I would probably respond to this and, you know, probably agree with, you know, obviously some things and we can get into financial deregulation that had grave consequences. And every, pre every president makes decisions. Some of those decisions work out. Some of them in hindsight end up looking horrendous, um, but would say this was the period of greatest, it wasn't perfect, but was the period of greatest economic prosperity since the new deal. And uh, yeah, I mean, so, what it you know when we did that despite a divided congress for the entire all but the first two years of the presidency so you know shouldn't we get some credit here well i think there's a question about that and so that i mean so the side of the kind of the growth model that the that mm -hmm. the, the 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 first the watergate babies atari democrats the new democrats are are um promoting the clinton administration really does implement and that does lead to the kind of growth that they um that that they hope, I mean, beyond what they, I think they were actually anticipating it to do. Um, and so in the kind of particular kinds of promotion of these, these um, critical sectors, I would argue that, so, and I think that this is the, the point and, men, and many people I interviewed for the book made that to me. Mm -hmm. And they said the, who, from the Clinton administration, like that's, that, that there's this idea that like, look at all the, look at the growth, look what happens after, like this is like, this critical moment. And, and I think that's right. Like, and in a, in a in the moment of like really the roots of, of polarization mm -hmm. emerging, um, if not emerged, um, the uh, what I would say is that it while that happened, it's also left the, the economic the the um, economic scale became increasingly unequal by the end of the '90s and then especially beyond, which has its legacy and it has its roots in this this period. And I think the one of the things that it did the two parts of it to me um, that it left low income and poor people in a much more vulnerable position. So there might've been overall economic growth and there was like, there was, prosper there was like a sense of prosperity, but, um, but in a lot of the programs of replacing, so welfare to work is, or welfare reform is like a critical one of thinking about it, that you have a replacement of, the, of this New Deal program that's a, that's a safety net um, with a, like a, the idea of a job, like a, a job. And I look at also this promotion of like entrepreneurship as a potential solution too. Um, and that, um, that leaves people without this kind of critical safety net when things go wrong. And so one of the things about what happens in welfare reform in particular is that it was to, do, to implement that program in a time of prosperity when there were lots of jobs available sort of worked, but then once jobs weren't available, you have all these people who can't get access to the jobs that were that they need to get any kind of support Th that is really important and then i think it also because of the ways in which um so much of the the 
the Clinton era growth is built on this, these policies of deregulation and competition, that it left poor, poor and low income people much more open to the kind of um, in, instabilities and also, frankly, to predation from the market. Um, so you lose the kind of protections of kind of separating the public and private sector from each other. And part of the programs also were this idea of sort of saying to, to corporations, like, look at this market that's available to you. Like, so Bill Clinton went on these tours to kind of bring Walgreens executives to low income communities. And so there's a there's one of the things that happens is like those companies have no they will move there to kind of provide jobs or to make a profit, but like they don't have any ob obligation in the same way the government does. Um, so once once they decided that particular places weren't profitable, they could just leave. The other piece of it is that to, um, and the, the darker view of it is that it opened up for predation by, um, especially by um, the mortgage and housing industry that leads to the um, the mortgage crisis, like that has direct, the has the direct, the direct consequence of that are the mortgage crisis um, a dec less than a decade later. I think those specific examples are very important because you could sit here and say, yes, we didn't make every, there were all the right decisions. Yes, uh, for the prosperity was not as broadly shared as we'd like, but but inequality is going up around the world because it's not just the United States, right? It's going up around the world because of because of globalization, because of changes in technology, the the sort of qu the quality jobs either either in the United States or abroad that you know we sort of think as of quality blue collar union jobs are disappearing, and so this is where we are and. But there are, but you're you're honing on these specific decisions that exacerbated the trend. It wasn't. It's like it's not in my mind, at least, fair to say that Bill Clinton or, as I would obviously defend Barack Obama, failed to solve the inequality problem. Like that is not a solvable problem that one president can do. But what are the decisions that he, that people made that exacerbate the trend? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, and I think that is this issue. And I like I even say this in the book. Like to just to blame all of this on. I think there's two parts. Like to blame all of this on Clinton, or to say that someone like Barack Obama or Joe Biden could fix everything mm. is unfair. Like it's too much to put on one thing, especially these are deep structural problems. But there are key choices. There were like they were operating within a sense of choices and they made deliberate choices in Clinton mm -hmm. in, during the Clinton era. Um, and that lead to the kinds of inequities that, um, that get seen. And I don't, you know, it's beyond me to say that they like, and I don't think, and it's not to say like Bill Clinton foresaw that like there was going to be a huge foreclosure crisis. Yeah. And a lot of those problems became much, much more intensified under the Bush administration and their own and like, the, and their, their acceleration of a lot of that kind, those kinds of mm -hmm. forms of deregulation, and then also even further shrinking um, the social safety net from what it was. But I do think that those those kinds of things do did end up leaving um, poor poor and low income people in a in a farther in a much much uh, worse place. I think the other issue is that um, this idea of kind of using growth as a solution, um, it, it like it didn't actually ask for very many sacrifices from, so if you say like corporations can do something, it's not then asking them to make very many sacrifices. And so that's the other thing, like it's not tied with like higher taxes or other types of things that could sort of go along with that. And that also contributes to the kind of inequities that, that become borne out um, by the end of the 1990s and then in, really seen over the last 20 years. You know, some of the, you know, a lot of your book, and I think there are some, Bill Clinton is an inherently political animal. He famously or notoriously consumes polling. And, you know, after his that first loss in the governor's race, he uh, signs up with Dick Morris, who eventually and then replaces uh, or brings along Mark Penn, another famously cynical pollster who would go on to also advise Donald Trump in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but the, you tell a lot, of the, a lot of your book focuses on the people who worked for Bill Clinton, who came up in the DLC, Al Fromm, Bruce Reed, Elaine Kmark, these folks. And I think some of that, some of these people are, uh, are friends of mine. And I think what some of them would say, and probably said to you, is yes, we are not traditional New Deal Democrats. We think, you know, the solution of the 30s, 40s, 50s all work for the whatever decade we're in now. But we would, in a different political environment with a different Congress, and frankly, a different Demo congressional Democratic Party, we would have had a, a greater mix of the two, right? Like Bill Clinton's 92 platform is a little bit more, 
I think of a you know, like it, it's obviously framed in um, you know very Atari Democrat terms, but he also is running on universal health care, right? And then it's part of his five you know the jam, famous James Carville things he writes down. Don't forget about health care is number five on the principles of the campaign. And they tr- you know is this a different picture if there is a they don't lose Congress in '94. We don't get the new the contract for America. Just is there like a is there an alternative version of history that is even if it's still overly reliant on market based solutions has more of a mix. I think there probably would be. I think the other thing that happened, um, and it's also to the fact that, and this was something that came to really interest me in the book, was the lack of oppos- like political opposition from the mm. left pushing on Bill Clinton. Yeah. And so I think that that to to me. Um, and I think that that's another moment that's like different than today that you didn't that that I m- pointed out that like in the 80s, there was these kind of different alternative paths of the party um, by the night. It seems to me that by the like and I think it's after healthcare, it's after 94, really, yeah. then like the, the sort of real failures that all of these kind of pressure, these kind of pressure groups on the left, they push on certain issues, but there's not this kind of unified left opposition. So I think that also is a, would have, like, mm-hmm. having that might have pushed things in a different direction, too. So it's less, I think that there's, like, political pressures, and we can see it with, I think, I do think that today Biden is having to contend with 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 an outspoken, you know, not fully unified, but more unified um, left wing of the party, on, and that's and having to address those in politics and something in a way that Bill Clinton did not um, mm. in like after 1996. I mean, there's that that that's another place to me. So that that I think that that also pushed him in various different ways. And it is true. Like I think that on there are c- certain things that they gave up, and even on a lot of the market based stuff, like the um, the. Um, on things like domestic microenterprise, like he wanted to do, they wanted he wanted to do more with it and mm. and didn't because it was just sort of like this isn't going to work in the ways that we want to yep. do, and I want to push for other things instead. It the um, or empowerment zone is another example. Yep. Like they couldn't put the money into it that they wanted to to actually make it a really effective a kind of effective program they wanted to be. There's a lot of interesting parallels between the period you write about and where the Democratic Party is now. I mean, uh, you you reference the. Um, politics of evasion report written for the DLC. It was a very famous report, which I actually yeah, to give people a little bit of summary of. But notably, the authors of that report reissued a ver- an updated version of it uh, just a couple of months ago. Um, so we're we're this debate about should Democrats get should we try to win back the people we've lost? The conversation is now a little more rural area than it was suburban in the course of the eighties, and now. Um, and so let's talk a little about the politics of evasion, and then I want to try to draw some parallels to the moment we're in now. Sure, I, um, and I would be really, cur- I would be interested in hearing your thoughts too, and like the on the parallels. Mm-hmm. Um, the so the politics of invasion is this post. It's it's a post mortem memo written by Elaine K. Mark and Bill Galston, um, two, two political scientists, um, that the DLC commissions, um, and it it argues that that. Um, really that the party should should not focus like the, the Jesse Jackson approach is not a good approach for the Democratic Party that the party should not be focused on um, trying to get sort of not who they def- define as non-voters of um, of um, basically um, underrepresented groups um, uh, people of color um, women low-income voters in, into the party and instead it's to focus on these kinds of um, these d- the people that they see as kind of swing reliable swing voters. Ra- Reagan Democrats. Basically. Reagan Democrats and moderate sub- like the yeah. sort of moderate suburbanites who in in like um, su- like sunbelt states um, yeah. and that is really where the party's future lies um, and I do think I mean it's, it was interesting to me because r- I was finishing working on this book in um, in 2020 mm-hmm. and like that conversation is just it is this thing that like it's very unresolved mm-hmm. within the Democratic Party and I do think it speaks to these deeper just sort of fundamental tensions um, that have to do with strategy but do have to do with policy too because in some ways like the kinds of things you're promising that you're going to do get affected by which of that like which which of those two approaches you adopt um, and so that that would be my so I, I would yeah. be curious on your thoughts about it the yeah I mean it's it's interesting because the answer then and now is both we don't actually have a choice and it's even, it's actually more true now because 
of the Republican Tilshield Electoral College, where to win the presidency, a Democrat has to appeal to a large number of voters who are more conservative than the median Democrat. It's just as long as people, if less people start moving out of this state and heading to Wisconsin, that we're gonna, that's, that's a problem that is going to continue for, for a long time. But what is, I think, interesting, the other parallel I saw between 92, the 92 election and the 2020 election is, in 1992, it is impossible to overstate how desperate the Democrats were to win. That was a prime, it, you know, whether it was Kennedy and Carter in 80, whether it was Jackson and Hart or Jackson and Gephardt to a little bit of a lesser extent in 88. There were these, I, like, the New Deal versus Atari Democrat thing was the course of the debate. And it was, it's unfair to put the mantle of liberalism on Jesse Jackson in 1984 in America. Um, but that was the battle, right? And then we, as a party, got, we lost in 80. We got killed in 84. We lost to George W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, who we generally, you know, was a person who'd been on the cover of Newsweek as the wimp fat, you know, just like we, we lost to, we kept losing. And so in 1992, there was no, it was like 2020 and in some ways it was a, the candidates might have wanted to talk about policy, but the voters wanted to talk about electability. And that was sort of Bill Clinton's strength. Well, and I think, and I was going to say, I mean, I think that absolutely yeah. was the strength. Um, I think the other, the question, mm. I mean, there is this issue then about, so the, I, I'll say mm. one thing about that. I mean, I, I, and I agree, like, I think that, I think he's, I think that Bill Clinton, especially in his 1992 campaign, was a really, really effective candidate and a, an effective, a, a, effective um mouthpiece. And one of the things the DLC did see in him is that he could speak to multiple constituencies because he could capture the South. He also had these kind of liberal roots um, that, as we were talking about, become increasingly sort of sublimated over He'd the... He'd come out of the McGovern campaign. Yes. Yeah, so that yes. was this idea that he was a McGovernite. He had those yeah. he had those ties. He could like have these multiple kind of audi audiences. And so that made him a really, really effective candidate. And I think it's like... In, I think one of the problems, and especially with the DL... there's This is, this is more of a, I think, a Democratic strategy question but like that the or the deal i think one of the reasons that i mean the dlc sort of becomes why people who started following politics 10 years ago might not have heard of them is like that they in their they both it could be that they were victims of their own success but also this problem that they were so beholden to build the bill clinton strategy right. and that he's like a very unmatchable candidate um in many in many ways so that kind of holds them I, the other thing i would say i think has been a real problem um, about the approach there, um, and this goes back to the politics of evasion, as I, I think I alluded to it earlier, is that they, um, it's really focused on the presidency, and I think that that actually becomes the Democratic Party's, like that becomes yeah. the Democratic Party's strategy from 1988 onward. So it's great that it wins in 1992, yeah. but the problem is that there's all the investment goes to the presidency, and so the, there's, it becomes a lack of kind of investment at the, at the, um, at congressional level at the at the state and at the local level that has had also been oh, yeah, with a problems. devastating effect and it's in part i think because the view was at the time that the, Dem the H democrats had held the house since the 40s or whatever it was at that point and it survived reagan like even in years republicans were winning 46 48 states democrats were holding the house so we had the house and then the Senate was going back and forth every couple of years, just sort of in reaction to whoever had won or lost the presidency. And so they sort of put, uh, but to your point, that obviously has had devastating effects up and down the ballot, everywhere else. Um, but the other thing that I think um, affected um, Bill Clinton, is sort of the DLC and Bill Clinton, was not, the world also changed dramatically. Like, the end of, like, if you sort of trace the period you're talking about is the 80s through January 20th, 2001, when Bill Clinton leaves office. And obviously the way he left office, his last few years were mired in scandal. The departure from office was messy, to say the least. And then the entire world changed nine months later on 9-11, which moved a lot of, I think, the sort of things that the DLC had pushed for way down the list of concerns for voters, right? Yeah, and I think that is this moment of like that question of like what's similar and what's different yeah. and sort of thinking about that as this kind of mark, this mark periodization. I mean, I would say the other thing that's really fascinating too is like the ways in which, I think it's a lot because of that issue of like what changed. And so one of the other things is that all these sectors, like what all these economic sectors also are changing dramatically over the course of the 1990s and that also becomes borne out. So like the, like the tech, tech, is emerging in different kinds of ways. And so, I mean, 
having to sort of contend with that coupled with things like the real effects of globalization and then like the banking sector changing. So and also there's something in the book of like matching the d poverty programs to those these sectors that are yeah. just changing rapidly also yeah. has the effect. So that goes back to the question of like where inequality comes from, that these th those are changing. So that's another place that you have this key hmm. difference. Um, we have some audience questions here. Um, weren't there some successes in the Clinton administration? And I, obviously there were, and you write about some of them in the book, but if there were a couple that you would point to, even if they were successful, are there successful market, uh, examples of their market-based approach? Yeah, um, so the, I mean, some of the places that it can be seen um, as effective, and this is one that's smaller. Um, so one of the things that the book tracks um, is, and I, we didn't talk about really, is this program mm. called, um, this community development banking program called ShoreBank um, that emerges in Chicago um, from the neighborhood of South Shore, actually where Michelle Obama's from, um, that was addressing using commercial banking to help um, to help do economic development. And it's a really, it's a really, um, interesting program that Bill Clinton learns about um, in, in 1980, the 19, early 1980s in Arkansas and brings to Arkansas. Um, and then it becomes, he he really s promotes it and sells it. I mean, it's fallen out of the kind of historical narrative, but it was a huge part of his um, campaign in 1992. And he does implement a program call, um, to 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 make that part of the federal government um, in the um, it's the community development financial institutions um, fund it's a real mouthful um, they needed a better term for it or C it's called the CDFIs um, and those are I think I think that it's a it's a really um, it it ha there's a lot of potential to that program they've actually gotten a lot more attention um, during both in the sort of aftermath of of 2000 um, 2008 but especially during the pandemic as providing sort of critical relief to people it's been an issue that even during the Clinton era they pushed for more funding for but it's been critically underfunded um, and to me that's a, a sign of kind of a, a successful program that's sort of been implemented into government and is a legacy um, is a legacy that lives on. How much of the new Democrat school of policy thinking is influenced by economic, economic, economic academic debates like the University of Chicago school versus political, you like the political will of the country? I, I think it's a it's a combination um, that you Clinton did bring in. Um, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole um, a whole group of academic thinkers. Um, there's an argument actually, and this is not mine, but there's someone who wrote a book called. Um, uh, what is it, Liberalism Reinvented, or I can't think of the full title. Stephanie Mudge, she teaches at um, UCSD. Um, no, it's UCS. Yes, UC, UC, yeah, is that right? Um, San UCS, Diego? No, 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 Davis, sorry. UC, 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 Davis, UC, UC Davis, Davis, UC Davis, yes. Davis sorry. Um, she, um, she argues that a lot of the people who are Clinton economic policy thinkers are actually not academics. Um, and so that actually affects kind of some of the political thinking. Like so, this is the Gene Sperling. Yeah, right. well, Gene Sperling, I mean, he doesn't have a degree in um, economics, yeah. but even, um, but I mean, even Rubin's not an economist. Yep. So you have different, you have a different kind of, you have a different brand of kind of thinking going forward. I think that, so I think, I don't think they were, in, they, I mean, I think Bill Clinton was aware of a lot of those debates. I mean, that goes to sort of his, his awareness of sort of thinking about mm -hmm. these types of things, but, um, but is not like, that goes to the thing of like the neoliberalism is not like this like we're going to adopt these theories wholesale and bring them in. It's more um, it's more kind of what will, what what do we think will work in this particular moment? You know, there's another like a lot of this book that really made me think of sort of like the sliding doors moments here, right? Like the like you you've written a lot about Michael Dukakis. The interpretation of Michael Dukakis is loss. Democrats are very bad at understanding why we lost elections, and we tend to pick one reason and it's often the wrong one and then we build the entire party strategy around that uh, but the sort of view was michael dukakis was a soft on crime liberal uh and so we needed something the opposite of that but michael dukakis was sort of an atari democrat in a lot of ways oh he's huge i mean so yeah. and this goes to my first like in my first book i mm -hmm. mean he i think actually like the and and it's interesting he was not a member of the dlc and like they they will concede that like he actually shared a lot of their policies yeah. i mean it, it, bill clinton gave his nomination speech at the yeah. at the convention famously boringly so yes. but, like the worst feature i think he says yes. like the worst feature he ever gave it was, play, but, was like, played off the stage like he had just won like the award for <laughs> writing in a short form documentary at the oscars <laughs> <laughs> um i i have never i actually wanted to find i couldn't find it on the on it's the on internet. youtube somewhere oh, 
it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe he'll dig I'm sure the Clintons it. have done a lot of work to try to erase it, but it's the internet is a powerful <laughs> thing. Yeah. I tried to look on C-SPAN, I couldn't yeah. find it, so that's like that. It shows that if you can control C-SPAN, I guess yes, you really yes. can, you can really get in there. But the um, the um, but that I mean, so I think that that Dukakis is this kind of moment, and I, the interesting thing about Dukakis too, to, to I mean, the wimp factor is also George mm. H. W. Bush is yeah. not a great candidate, yeah. and Dukakis was actually up in the polls by um, by like se I mean like seven he was up in by seven points, I think, in July. Yeah. So this, he actually was a competitive candidate because of the ways he was selling these ideas of like um, economic growth and kind of, I mean, he, his thing was competency, not ideology or, um, yeah. and that like, that's not a great slogan. So I think that that, um, but that captured what he was, would have aimed to do. And I, I, there is a, there is a question of him like being a more successful candidate. He also, this goes more to my first book, um, which is about suburban liberals, but he was a voter who did really, he did really well with suburban voters um, in and was actually critical to winning over a lot of swing voters, especially in northern um, affluent suburban states. And the, the other sort of interesting sort of way to think about this is Bill Clinton is perhaps one of the least, with the exception of Donald Trump, least like most unlikely presidents in American history. He all, probably only won that primary because every other person who was a famous, powerful Democrat decided not to run. Joe Biden did not run. Al Gore did not run, and famously Mario Cuomo did not run. And so in a different world, Bill Clinton does not win that primary. But also, he, he also arrived, and this is, I think, one thing that's a point of sympathy for the Clinton folks. He also arrives in the White House as the weakest president in history because he gets, whatever it is, 43% of the vote in a race he may not have won, although everyone who works for Bill Clinton will say otherwise, may not have won without Ross Perot doing so well as a third-party candidate, right? So there's a world in which... The, we do not, it wasn't like the 1992 election was, it, it elected a Democrat, which is something we very much wanted, but it wasn't an overwhelming national consensus for new democratic, Atari democratic market approached policies, essentially, right? Yeah, I think that's a thing too. And I, you know, that was not, there wasn't a sense and there was, I mean, and, and there was fraught, I mean, after, um, you know, famously with things like the sister soldier moment, there was like fraught, there, there wasn't a uniform support amongst the Democrats yeah. even. Like it wasn't like we've, we like, I don't think there was the same. And I, I, I was young when I, so I don't mm. fully remember. Um, I, I like vaguely remember Bill Clinton mm. being elected in 92, but like th there wasn't the kind of energy like when Obama mm. won that like the, like amongst like wide groups. I don't think there was a sense, same, the same, it didn't have the same kind of attention amongst kind of people who define themselves mm. as Democrats in the, in the same way. And I think that's right. I think, and I think it's interesting because they do come in with a sense of a, um, a stronger sense of a mandate than that, um, mm. but did not have the kind of political, like didn't have the yeah. kind of deep political support. So I, I actually think it's amazing. I mean, that goes to the other question of successes. Um, one thing I learned from doing mm. this, this um, having never worked in an mm. administration, um, and um, Cheryl Cashin, who I interviewed for the book as a professor at Georgetown Law School, who worked in the Clinton administration, made this point to me too: is that like you really only have like six months to get things done. I mean, yeah. so there are two things I was like thought found really fascinating. One is that like the period of getting policy, like coming up with policy ideas after you went, like after Clinton won to coming into office, you have to like basically came out with like a blueprint of like this is yeah. what we have to do, and that was fascinating to me. But also like you can't get like there's like such a narrow window of actually getting things accomplished. And I think that's happened in so many administrations too. So I do think they understood that they had to do a lot really fast. And they're and you know, they're more populist, more traditional ideas ran afoul of other Democrats, right? The elements of their first budget were killed because um, John Bro killed the BTU, the energy tax in there. I mean, it's a, it, we're telling a different story about Bill Clinton and inequality if his health care bill passes in 94, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I do, I do think that's another moment of like that, that is this question mm -hmm. of the counterfactual too. Yeah. Like what would have happened if that, like what, it, what would have happened with that as well? I mean, and so that, I, do, I do think that is really critical. And I do think it's, that's another thing to the point of like the Democratic Party itself looked quite, di did look different in 1982 than it does in, in 2022 mm -hmm. as well. And so as we sit, we're sitting here today, Joe Biden is president, the Democrats have the House and the Senate. To what extent, and you, know, you can take this obviously back to the, the Obama administration, but what ex, to what extent do these, this sort of new Democrat market-oriented approach still infect how the party thinks about solving problems like inequality and unemployment and the general problems in our economy? I think that the, I think 
in some ways, like its cultural effect has, doesn't have the same thing. So I don't have, I mean, I always say this, like this goes to both, both places, but I, I guess because mm. my narrow window is like spending time with my, with my students, like mm. there's not the same euphoria for market oriented thinking. Yeah. I don't, I didn't, you didn't hear as much of it. I mean, I mean actually Cory Booker was the person who most mm. pushed it at in the, in the Democratic yeah. primary. Um, it, and it didn't really take hold in the same way. So I don't think there's the same energy for these kinds of approaches. Like micro enterprise was not like at the heart of Biden's agenda for how he was going to solve problems. I do think the growth part is, I mean, there's still this idea of like promoting growth in various different ways. Um, so in some ways, like the, the, um, the, the overt promotion of these policies is no longer sort of at driving party party um, message, the message or the, or the kind of um, political speeches. But I do think there's, it's, it, ha it has influenced like large scale policy issues um, in various different ways. Um, and I do wonder this question too of like that I think there's less, less um, there's a recognition that these ideas are just not, um, they're not as effective both in terms of policy but also I don't I just don't think they have the same they've, they've come to hold the same kind of political power that they once did that they there's a sense like like what I argue in the book is I think that one of the things is this this approach did is to actually alienate a lot of low in, low income and poor people from the Democratic Party that like Bill Clinton did not deliver the things that were expect that, that was sort of set out to do by what the market could do um, and so either people stop voting or or I think many and many turn to Trump and the Republican Party mm -hmm. as, as selling something else. Um, I think a lot of um, young people um, like increasingly sort of see this as not the approach that they're not as invested in this is the way I'm gonna we're gonna sort of get secure like security they don't want to like they want the, the sort of secure like security of a real social safety net um, and that has been borne out too. In a weird way, the Democratic Party is probably more divided along the axis that you write about than it was in the 90s because as you as you point out particularly after 90, 95, 96, uh, there isn't anyone pushing to Bill Clinton's left for a traditional solution. Obviously, you have um, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, you know, certainly a, a lot of people in the House of Representatives who are, pu who, you know, are pushing what I think would f fit in the modern day 2022, whatever year this is, version of that, you know, which is Medicare for all. It's canceling student debt. It's a lot, you know, some of the programs in which Biden embraced in his Build Back Better agenda around uh, child care and family leave and those sorts of things. Um, but there is like that debate is still like that was the the I mean, in some ways, the entire uh, conversation has actually sh shifted left since the 90s. If you think like the polls of the debate around health care were a single payer plan based in Medicare and uh, adding a government option to the already existing program, that's a pretty, re you know, relative to the discussion of the 90s, is a pretty left agenda. But I'm curious how, you know, when you look at Biden, because what I think is really notable is that some of the major characters in your book are sitting in the Oval Office with Joe Biden right now. Bruce Reed's the senior advisor. Gene Sperling is overseeing, um, I think, the American Rescue Plan at this exact moment, but is also, I think, knowing Gene, a uh, very active advisor to the president. Uh, there's a lot of, there's probably more senior people from that 92 campaign working in this White House than worked in Obama's, at least in the beginning. Right? Yeah, I think that that's right. And so, I mean, I, that's always, and I wonder, that is a question, like, and I think that this goes also. And, and just related to that, I just want to ask this before we run out of time. And where does Biden fit in here? Because he actually was, I should have asked this earlier, but Biden was at, in the center of Democratic Party politics for this entire period, right? Well, and that's, I mean, so I, I'll say, I'll, I'll answer your, the first, yep. the second question first. Yep. I mean, so Biden is a founding member of the DLC. And actually it's, it's interesting because they, um, in 1988, there's like a very crowded primary and they decide not to back in, they back Al Gore because they don't think he's like, he doesn't believe in their message as much. Mm -hmm. um, and they think he's too like a much of a maverick that they just don't like trust him. But I think that actually speaks to something about his, that he doesn't, as I read Biden, he doesn't have, and his evolution, like he doesn't have the same kind of like core ideological, um, like ideological, sort of commitment that I see in someone like Bill Clinton. And I think that this is something like, so we just talked about 92, the 92 election and how um, there is this, 
like it, it wasn't ideal, but I do think that the DLC saw it as a chance to kind of move the party. Like that's what they're committed to. I don't think, Bi like Biden, he explicitly said like, I represent the Democratic, yeah. like, the will of the Democratic Party. And I say that as like a critical difference. Like yeah. he moved, he's moved with the party or at least, and he's another person, like it's hard to know what he actually, at this point, mm -hmm. like like f firmly believes, but I think he believes he's the mouthpiece of the Democratic Party, and it's and it's what it's say the 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 big carve out on that is crime, and I do think the State of the Union was really interesting for that because um, that has been a core issue of his. I mean, and that's where he saw overlap with the DLC and with Clinton in various different places. I mean, being critical of the, the ninety four crime bill, um, and I think as I read parts of the State of the Union, like he's returning to that um, that idea. So I think that's a place that. Um, he's evolved in some ways as representing what the like as a as an interesting representative of where the party has gone um, and its own division its own divisions in some capacity. Um, to the question of um, the advisors, I mean, and this is also where sort of to me strategy and policy go in various different ways. And I think that there has been a, a sense that um, I in it could there it could be like an adaptation that like the, like these other ideas just didn't work in the ways that we wanted to and we need to find a new we the solutions of the, maybe it's like the solutions of the 90s yeah. aren't going to meet the problems right. of 2022 and i do think there's that part my one concern is that um a lot of these ideas do did seem to sell politically and so there's a like in a moment of kind of this crisis of 1980 like what's going to happen in the midterms that there's like a, a return like a sense of like return to that but i do think as I, as far as i've seen it there's like a there has been a sense that like we cannot go back to what happened under bill clinton as a solution to addressing the kind of real economic crises that the united states is in right now i i think that's right because i think i think there's uh there's not a political appetite for it. the makeup of the democratic party has shifted dramatically in that 20, however many year, 30, 30 year period now since 92. Um, and, uh, and so like who we're reaching, and then the scale of the problems, like the, like 92, the nineties were this period, this weird period of calm-ish prosperity compared to what came before and certainly what the next 22 years would look like with 9-11, the financial crisis, et cetera. The thing I wanted to say just that is interesting is um, from the perspective of someone who has been in that building and sort of in these decisions, is that people are people who make the decisions are very are more complicated than you know not just the presidents but the advisors. Like like Gene Sperling is someone who's very associated with Clintonomics. Like he's kind of branded it, and Gene is actually one of the biggest liberals I know. Right, he came out of he came from Mario Cuomo. Like he went from Mario Cuomo to Bill Clinton. And Bruce Reed, who a lot of the left loves to attack, um, and they sort of really try to torpedo his role as being OMB director, came up with probably Barack Obama's most progressive tax policy idea for the State of the Union in '94. So there, there is this sort of um, sort of you know set of complications here. Um, I'm curious. Like, there is a chance that there is going to be another Demo and this, this this can be our last question. I'll close this. But there's a chance there's going to be another Democratic primary in um, a couple years, right? If, if President Biden were to decide not to run, but if not, if that does not happen, then soon after we will have another big grand debate ideologically about where the party should go. What do you want to see in that debate? What's the, uh, you know, or what, what do you want to see in it? What, what would give you some fear about it? But where do, you, where do you think this all goes from here? Well, I think it's, I mean, in some, in some ways um, it's, it's a, it's a, I, I don't think it's a return to what was like, and definitely not to like the Clinton yeah. era, but a return to like, like I never, like I always try to impart when I teach my students, like it's like, we don't, we don't want like to go back. To, there were a lot of problems with the new deal. So it's not right. like, let's just like bring back the new deal. Yeah. And, um, and like for, um, but, um, but I think it is a way of kind of thinking about the fact that there, that the, that there are many, many Americans, um, who are facing a real sense of, um, of insecurity, um, economically, like in, in all fronts and to that the Democratic Party can can represent and deliver those kinds of ideas. I think one thing that, um, that and I do think this is happening that's really important is um, that um, another place that the that the DLC was actually really successful is basically in marginalizing the labor from the Democratic Party. Like, I, like, it, like it's amazing how little la the labor movement got mentioned. I mean, even in like presidential campaign. I mean, I think they're yeah. still like going behind the scenes, but like, as like, we're going to, I'm going to like be behind labor. And I think that Biden has done, ha has had to do that as the labor movement has been much more resurgent. So I think bolstering that, supporting that um, would be really critical for a candidate. And I do think kind of coming back to it, this sense of like the power of us, of separating out 
the public and private sectors from each other. I mean, not trying to sort of turn to the private sector to do what the, what is actually the responsibility of government and giving giving um, people a sense of of stronger security. So that would be what I would like to see from a Democratic Party, and hopefully that like you'd have candidate like the majority of candidates representing that that message um, and not this kind of te- this fought tension. Yeah, it is uh, one. I mean, one thing has definitely changed since, and this is. Driven especially true since 2008, but was changing slowly over time for the 90s. Is ni- the 90s were a period where we celebrated business and business leaders, right? It was Steve Jobs and Lee Iacocca and Jack Welch, and those people were on TV all the time. And, you know, and that sort of came out of the 80s. And that's not a thing that happens in the same way. Like there is a great national skepticism of business like business is in many cases like big business corporations is is as unpopular as congress in many studies and that's definitely not popular um so it seems unlikely that you would i think in the near term you would have a democrat like that is now actually democrats being seen as anti-business was its greatest weakness was one of its greatest weaknesses in the 80s which has sort of led to uh, the view that that sort of market oriented approach was an was an electable approach and now being seen as being being seen as pro business is the Republicans' greatest political weakness, and so that that dynamic has shifted. Yeah, and it'll be interesting. I mean, I, and then I, I mean, it is fascinating, like putting not money where the mouth is of yeah. like supporting. I mean, I think the hard thing is like the influence that mo- money can yeah. have, and I haven't, I didn't look at that in this book bu- bu- yeah. necessarily, but I think that that is this kind of question that like the distancing. I mean, that you don't have like the same promotion. I mean, Bill Clinton at all of like, was constantly out with Bill Gates yeah. and other figures. Um, and I think Obama did, did yeah. actually did that to some degree too. Did, yeah. And that, um, and that has, that has, has shifted. And so it'll be interesting to see how that actually maps on to not just messaging, but like pol- to policy yeah. too. Well, Lily, thank you so much. This is all the time we have for in today's program. I want to thank everyone who joined us here in person and, and online for this important Commonwealth Club program. Please make sure to pick up a copy of Lily's book, Left Behind the Democrats Failed Attempt to Solve Inequality, either here after the program or wherever you purchase your books. This program and others like it will soon be online at the club's website. Once again, I'm sure you can figure this out, but www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. This Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned. I feel like I should have a gavel for that. But yeah. (laughs)